Okay, so um, welcome to this lecture. My name is Jimmy Chirumira, and I'll be taking you through uh, systemic pharmacology as you as you see. And uh, so, I'll just to go through a little bit of the content outline of what we shall cover during uh, systemic pharmacology. Um, so we are going to be covering um, cardiovascular pharmacology, as you can see. We are going to be covering renal pharmacology. We shall do gastrointestinal endocrine, respiratory pharmacology, musculoskeletal, and integumentary system pharmacology. We shall do hemo, you know, hemopoietic and uh, hemostatic uh, drugs or uh, hemopoietic or hemostatic pharmacology. Now, you realize this is, uh, this is really too much. Yeah? So please, uh, I, want, I, would want, I would want from you um, maximum cooperation. Yeah? Maximal cooperation. And please make sure that for you to be able to understand these things, make sure that you read further. Do not only rely on the lecturer. Make sure that you read the textbooks. If need be, watch the videos so that you should be able to understand this uh, systemic uh, pharmacology. It's quite too much, but we shall do our level best to make sure that we complete all this. Yeah. So um, that is that has been a little bit of the content outline, and then the detailed outline is, is basically that in uh, in, your in cardiovascular pharmacology we shall do antihypertensives, and that is going to be our topic today. Uh, we shall do uh, drugs that are used in the treatment of hypertension and shock. We shall do antangina drugs. We shall do antirhythmic drugs. We shall do um, drugs that are used in congestive heart failure. And then we shall also do uh, antidepidemic drugs, among others. So basically, we are going to start with cardiovascular, you know, cardiovascular pharmacology, and specifically antihypertensives. But as we move on, we shall cover renal, gastro, uh, gastrointestinal pharmacology, among others. Now, the books that you have been using in basic pharmacology are going to be the same books that we are going to use in this particular uh, kind of uh, pharmacology. Please be ready for any assignments and be ready for some presentations when you're called upon to do so. Now, without wasting any more time, without wasting any more time, we want to start, um, we want to start straight away with, uh, you know, with uh, cardiovascular pharmacology and specifically anti-hypertensives. That is what we are going to be doing in a minute. And by the way, um, uh, this is going to kind of like be a lecture uh, where you will be required to watch the video and make your own notes. I repeat. Watch the video and make your own notes. There are some things that I'll be talking about that are not necessarily in the notes that I'll give you. Yeah, so please make sure that watch the video, make your own notes, and then these shall be supplemented by the notes that you will get at the end of the lecture. All right. So to start straight away, uh, we uh, um, straight away to start uh, with our topic, um, uh, cardiovascular pharmacology and specifically antihypertensives. Now, uh, I will send you a video. I will send you a video basically that uh, it, it is basically a short video, about 30 minutes for you to watch hypertension to to really uh, revise or review a little bit more about hypertension so that you should be able to understand very well the um the, the, the pharmacology behind you know antihypertensive so please make sure 
that you watch the video on hypertension and also uh, and then also um, go ahead and watch this video that we're going to have on uh, anti hypertensives again I want to repeat please make sure that you watch the video to the end and make your own notes as you're watching the video all right so um without wasting any more time without wasting any more time we want to start away right on uh, anti-hypertensives now it is very important it is very important for you to know that management of hypertension does not necessarily mean that you will give drugs yeah so when we are managing hypertension we do not only give drugs remember there are two types of hypertension if i can recap a little bit we have what we call primary hypertension this is where we do not have a known cause and then we also have secondary hypertension where we have a known cause so if you treat the known cause then you would have treated the hypertension but also remember if a patient comes to you and uh, you know they, uh, they they basically have mild they have mild to moderate hypertension we do not necessarily start straight away with the with uh, antihypertensives no we do not necessarily start straight away with antihypertensives but instead there's what we call life modification yeah there's what we call life modification and uh, and so you should be able to know that uh, that uh, as we treat hypertension as we treat hypertension uh, we, we don't always we do not always start with the, we do not always start with the, um, drugs yeah, but we do some kind of life modification first before we go ahead and use drugs. Now, what are some of these life modifications that we, we basically do? Yeah, um, of course, uh, I'm sure you know some of them that uh, one, exercise, exercise, exercise. Uh, your so exercise is very very important and how long is the exercise the exercise is about uh three to four days uh for, for 30 minutes yeah so an exercise uh, a rigorous exercise of uh, three to four days for 30 minutes three to four days a week yeah for 30 minutes this is very very important as far as uh you know management of uh, um, hypertension is concerned yeah so we also have uh, salt, you know, salt restriction, yeah? Salt re restriction, yeah? Restriction of salt. We have salt restriction, yeah? So in, in patients who, are, who, who, are pre who present with a mild, you know, to moderate, you want to tell them, you know, to exercise, to restrict um, salt, um, uh, stop smoking, you know, stop smoking. Um, may uh, maybe a uh, moderate, moderate or limit alcohol intake. Moderate or limit alcohol um, intake. Uh, we have things like um, you know. Uh, relaxation, you know, relaxation. Uh, we have things like, um, um, you know, uh, potassium rich, you know, potassium rich fat. Yeah. So relaxation, uh, potassium rich fat. And uh, of course, by potassium rich diets, we mean uh, things like uh, foods that are, are high in, uh, you know, uh, potassium, things like, um, um, things like uh, pot uh, 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 sweet potatoes, uh, things like uh, um, 
uh, bananas, bananas and all that. Yeah, things like um, um, apples, you know, all these are rich in, all these are rich in, uh, in potassium. Yeah, all these are rich in potassium. But we also have things like, uh, you know, lipid management, yeah, lipid management. And in here, you, you bas they basically have to control the amount of red meat, yeah, the amount of red meat that they eat. Yeah, so lipid control, so limit, limit red what? Red meat. Limit red meat. So these, these, are some of the, the intervention, or these are some of the first things that we do for a patient who is basically has been diagnosed to have hypertension. We do not straight away start with drugs, yeah? So if they try these and their blood pressures are still high or their blood pressure is still high, then we start, uh, you know, then we start medication, yeah? Then we can start uh we can start uh, medication yeah and then and of course we shall see we shall see some of these uh, uh some of these uh the things that that we basically start with yeah we shall see some of the medications that we we, we start uh some of the medications that we start with uh in the management of uh you know in the management of uh, of hypertension all right so um, with that in mind, we want to proceed, yeah, we want to proceed and say that um, what are the principles of management of hypertension, yeah? What are the principles, what are the principles of management of hyper? Tension, yeah. Remember, we are looking at antihypertensive, you know, we are going to look at antihypertensive pharmacology, but we do not straight away dive into the drugs. No, we do not. Yeah, we have to start from the basics and what we refer to as the first principles. For you to be able to understand these things, you have to start from past principles. Trust me, yeah. Trust me, you have to start from past principles, right? So what are the principles of management of hypertension? Yeah. In the video that you'll watch earlier, yeah, you will realize that um, blood pressure, blood pressure is basically contributed by two things. Blood pressure is basically contributed by two things. And what are these two things? Right. Yeah. So um, what are these two things? We have what we call the cardiac output, cardiac output, and what we refer to as the total peripheral resistance. Yeah. So those are the two. Those are the two things that uh, that basically determine the blood pressure and the pharmacology of antihypertensives basically revolves around the control. If you can control these two things, then you can very well control, you know, the, 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 the blood, the pressures of a hypertensive, um, um, of a hypertensive uh, patient. And uh, in the video, you will realize that basically the cardiac output is contributed or is the systolic part, systolic part of uh, blood pressure. And then uh, the total peripheral resistance is basically the diastolic part. It's, it's basically the diastolic part of, uh, you know, of blood pressure. You will watch more of this in the video, and then you will internalize uh, um, some of these things. Yeah. So uh, basically, um, to explain a little bit more. Cardiac output and total peripheral resistance are also determined by, you know, by some things, yeah? They are determined by some things as we are going to, as we are going to see, yeah? They are determined by some things as we are going to see. Now, um, cardiac output, yeah? Cardiac output is determined by two things as well, yeah? 
So we are saying that cardiac output here is also determined by two things. What are those things? It is determined by the heart rates and by the, what we refer to as by the stroke volume, yeah? So heart rates, you, I, I hope you know what heart rate means. It's basically the number, you know, uh, the number of times, yeah? Uh, per minute, yeah, the, the number of times the heart beats per minute. And then the stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected out of the heart, yeah? When, when we talk about, when we say out of the heart, mainly we, we are referring to the ventricles, yeah? That is ejected out of the heart, you know? Every time the heart, you know, pumps, yeah? Every time the heart pumps, yeah? So in other words, we are saying that our cardiac output is basically determined by stroke volume and, um, and, uh, and uh, heart rate, yeah? And then um, <clears throat> stroke volume, stroke volume is also determined by three things, yeah? Stroke volume is also determined by three things. One, it is determined by what we call, it is determined by what we call the contractility, contractility of the heart muscle, yeah? So contractility, contractility of the of the heart. In other words, um, I, I hope you have heard of in physiology about uh, the, the Frank Starling law. Yeah, if uh, if if the heart is able to contract very well, then it will push a significant amount of stroke volume out uh, out of the heart. Yeah, so the contractility. Yeah. Is, uh, is one of the things that basically determines the stroke volume, yeah? Now, um, we also have what we refer to as afterload. Afterload. Afterload, and what, we, and, and, and what we also refer to as preload. So these three things basically determine, you know, the stroke volume. What is afterload? I hope you still remember in your physiology afterload. This is basically the resistance against which the heart has to pump to overcome resistance. Yeah, this is the the the, the you know the force against which uh, the resistance against which the the heart has to pump to overcome um, resistance. This is what we mean. This is what we mean. Yeah. Assuming you have, assuming you have your, your left ventricle, uh, no, yeah, your left part of the heart, yeah, and then I see it's, it's basically a simple illustration, yeah, basically a simple illustration. Assuming this is your left, uh, left part of the heart, yeah, assuming this is your left part of the heart, and of course these are your, uh, if this is your left part of the heart, this would be your, what? Yes, the, 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 this is the mitral valve, and then this is your, um, this is your left, you know, left uh, atria, and then this is your left ventricle, and then of course you have, uh, you have uh, your aortic valve, yeah, you have your aortic valve, and then you have your mitral valve. Now, when you have, uh, when you have blood in here, yeah, when you have blood in here, when you have blood in here. Yeah, when you have blood in here, you know, this, this ventricle has to pump, yeah? This ventricle has to pump, yeah? So has to push blood, yeah? To, to push blood out. And the force, yeah? Uh, for the force against which it has to pump to overcome this resistance. Remember, remember that is resistance, yeah? There is resistance. So as it pumps, it needs to overcome, yeah? Some kind of resistance, yeah? For it to draw blood yeah, to the outside. And then that is what we refer to as after load. Is that clear? Right. Now, preload. Preload. Preload is the amount of blood, is the amount of blood that is present in the ventricles at the end of diastole. It's the amount of blood that is present in the ventricles at the end of diastole. In other words, diastole basically means relaxation, yeah? So at the end of ventricular diastole, 
That amount of blood that is within the ventricles is what we refer to as a preload, also referred to as end diastolic volume. Also referred to as end diastolic volume. Yeah? So preload is the amount of blood that is present in the ventricles at the end of diastole, or at the end of what we refer to as ventricular diastole. Yeah? So, stroke volume is basically determined by these three things. Contractility of the heart muscle of the myocardium, the afterload, remember we said this is the force against which yeah, the, 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 the ventricles have to come to overcome resistance. Yeah? And then preload. Now, understanding these basic principles will help us to know or to discuss some of these anti-hypertensives. Again, I repeat, understanding these basic principles will help us understand how we manage hypertension. Is that, is that okay? Right. Okay, so um, the story does not end here. No, no, the story does not end here. Preload is also determined, you know, by two things. Preload is also determined by two things, yeah? And one of them is what we refer to as the vessel, venomotor tone, and uh, the total uh, blood volume. So we are saying that preload, preload, if I can rub off this, yeah? If I can rub off this. We are saying that preload here, we are saying that preload here, in other words, the, the amount of blood that is that will come, that will come in the ventricles at the end of the stroke, yeah, the amount of blood that will come in the ventricles at the end of the stroke is also determined by two things. Is also determined by two things. And uh, one of the things is what we refer to as the venous, venous, you know, venovascular tone, yeah? What we call the veno motor, veno motor tone. Remember, what, 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 does, what does it basically mean? For blood to return, yeah? For blood to return to the heart. Basically, it has to, you know, it goes through the veins. I hope you, you know that very clearly. For blood to return to the heart, it has to go to the, through the veins. Now, for it to be able to go to, uh, to return to the heart, the, the, you know, the veins need to, co to contract, to constrict, yeah? So as they constrict, they basically push it towards the heart, yeah? So the venal motor tone will determine what we reach in the ventricles, yeah? And then the other thing that basically determines, um, you know, the, the, the preload is what we call the total, total blood what? Total blood volume. Total blood volume. So if you have, um, if you have uh, quite, uh, you know, a lot of blood in, uh, you know, if you have quite a lot of blood in your system, yeah, if you have a lot of blood volume in your system, then that basically means that you're at risk of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, of getting um, hyper, hyper uh, tension, yeah? All right, so um, basically those are the principles of management, yeah? Those are the principles of management of, um, of what? Of hypertension. Again, I want to repeat a little bit. I want to repeat for you a little bit for you to understand this. We are saying that Blood pressure is determined by two things. One is cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. Yeah. And then of course you know what you know what resistance means. Yeah. That uh, the, the, you know the, the resistance, you know what the word resistance means. Yeah. And then cardiac output is basically determined also by two things. It is determined by what we call the heart rate and the stroke volume. 
So in other words, cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate, yeah? Now, heart rate, of course, is the number of times, yeah? The, the heart beats per minute, yeah? And, uh, and then stroke volume, stroke volume, remember we said, is the amount of blood that is pumped, yeah? Out of the heart, pa, you know, every time the heart contracts, it pumps out blood, and that is what we refer to as stroke volume. Now, stroke volume is also determined, yeah, by three things, yeah? We said it is determined by the contractility of the heart, yeah? If the heart is able to contract very hard, then, then it will push out, it will pump out quite a number or quite a lot of blood, yeah? But not only that, but it is also determined by two other things. We have what we call the afterload and the preload. And we have already, of course, uh, we have uh, defined this, yeah? And then we saw that preload is also determined, in other words, the, the amount, the endostolic volume, the endostolic volume, in other words, the amount of blood that is present in the ventricles at the end of ventricular diastole is also determined by two things. It can be determined by venomotor tone, by the venomotor tone, yeah? So if the veins, veins are able to contract or constrict, then they are able to take back blood to the, you know, to the heart, yeah? It is also determined by the total blood volume, yeah? If you have a lot of blood in your system, then you're bound to have, um, you know, you're bound to have, um, um, you're bound to have, uh, you know, a, a blood pressure or, you know, a higher kind of like uh, blood pressure. Now, when we talk about principles of management of uh, hypertension, basically that is what we need. Now, you will realize that when you handle all these aspects of what we have talked about, then you're able to manage hypertension of a patient, yeah? When you handle all these aspects of what we have talked about, then you're able to manage hypertension of a patient. Is that okay? Right. So um, I want to draw, I want to draw a diagram. I want to draw a diagram that will basically help us as we look at these classes, yeah? I want to draw a diagram that will basically help us as we look at these classes of, of, um, um, of drugs, yeah? Uh, as we look at these classes of, uh, of drugs. It's basically, it, can, it is basically art, uh, artistic, yeah? Just for illustration, just for illustration purposes, yeah? Uh, and nothing, uh, nothing much, yeah? Now, uh, just imagine this is, uh, I want to make sure that it is very clear, yeah? Just imagine this is your, um, this is your left part of the, your right part of the heart, yeah? So you have, um, you have the right part of the heart. This is your right part of the heart and blood, of course, is returning, yeah? Um, this is, uh, this is your, your, your right ventricle, yeah? This is your right ventricle, <clears throat> and of course, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, with your right ventricle, we ha you have blood returning, you know, returning from the, you, you know these things, returning from the superior vena cava, yeah? And, uh, and, the, and, and the inferior vena cava is basically returning to the heart. And then uh, this is the, your right ventricle. And then, of course, uh, that is your uh, promenade trunk. And, of course, it is, leading to the, it is leading to the lungs, yeah? It is leading to, lung, to the lungs. So you have, uh, if, uh, if we can draw our lungs here, if we can draw our lungs here. So you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, it is, it is basically leading to that, yeah? And then you, you have on your, on, on the left side, you also have your, your left uh, part of the, part of the, um, of the heart. And, uh, and basically if you can do something like that, yeah? And uh, maybe something like that, yeah? 
Uh, that is your left part of the heart. Uh, of course, uh, it, uh, it goes, it, it comes, uh, this is, uh, if uh, maybe just to make it a little bit clearer, yeah, just to make it a little bit clearer. This is, um, that is your left, uh, your left part of the heart, yeah? Assuming, as I told you, this is basically uh, for, uh, for, for study purposes and, uh, and as a kind of like an artistic, um, uh, yeah. So you have the, you have the, the artery, the, you have the, you have the left part of the heart here, and then you have, this is the, uh, of course, the, the left part of the heart, and then this is the left artery. Yeah? So you have your, your iota, yeah, you have your iota. And it is, uh, it is basically, um, it is basically um, that, yeah? So you have your iota and uh, it, it's basically the same uh, like that, yeah? Now, um, assuming um, on this lower part, on this lower part, um, assuming it is basically leading to, um, you, you, you have, um, it is, of course, it gives, it gives rise to, gives rise to uh, arterioles, yeah, arterioles, yeah, and then um, it gives rise to arterioles. So these are the arterioles, and then these are the capillaries, yeah, so you have the arterioles, you have the capillaries, yeah, and then uh, you have, uh, you have the venues, yeah, you have eventually, you have the venues coming, you know, to, to link up with the, to link up with the, with the, with the, with the to link up uh, with the, uh, with the other part of the, of the, of, um, to link up with the other part of the heart, yeah? And then uh, basically something like that. And then uh, basically assuming that if I can also draw, um, if I can also draw um, the, if I can also draw the, the kidneys, yeah, if I can also draw the kidneys somewhere where you can see uh, maybe uh, somewhere here, uh, if I can draw the kidneys, some unfortunately you can't see there, but if I can draw the kidneys somewhere here, yeah, if I can draw the kidneys somewhere here, and uh, so something like these, Yeah, I hope you're able to see um, the kidneys. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, let me adjust the camera a little bit so that uh, you can see. Um, yes, yeah. so I'll adjust the camera a little bit. Yeah, so assuming these are your kidneys, yeah? And so the kidneys also have blood supply, uh, they have, uh, you know, they, they have uh, a connection, uh, of course, from the iota, yeah? uh, They have a connection from the iota, yeah? uh, Of course, uh, um, the renal artery, yeah? And then uh, they also have a connection, uh, a connection back to, um, back to the, to the um, back to the renal side of the renal, the renal thing, something like that, yeah? Something. So, so we are we are basically going to be um, dealing with the uh, with the diagram like this to explain our our concept, yeah. And then um, not only do we have um, this system here, but we also have the the brain, yeah, the brain or the central nervous system, yeah. So I'm also going to draw the central nervous system around here. So um, this is the cerebral cortex, yeah. Cerebral cortex, um, um, cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex, yeah, something like that, then uh, the medulla, the medulla, the bone, and then something like that. So something like, uh, something like, basically for, um, uh, illustration, illustration purposes, yeah, basically for um, illustration purposes. Now, um, 
assuming, so remember, we, we want to look at, we are trying to look at antihypertensives, yeah? And uh, they can all be uh, summarized in this diagram, yeah? As we are going to see. But it is also very important, ladies and gentlemen, to know that the sympathetic system, the sympathetic system plays a very, very big role as far as management of hypertension is concerned. Now, that is very, very important. Yeah? And I hope you have looked at the autonomic nervous system. Yeah? You have looked at the different receptors that come into play as far as uh, you know, blood pressure you know, management is concerned. Yeah? So that is very, very, um, very important. Now, um, the other thing I want to illustrate here is that um, within, within the brain, yeah, within the brain, in what we call the, the basal motor center, which is located in the medulla of Langata, yeah, of the brain, yeah, basal motor center located in the medulla of Langata of the brain, yeah, something like that, yeah. It, it basically has a quite, a, it has a track, yeah, which is, which is uh, you know, full of, which is a track, uh, which basically uh, has uh, you know sympathetic the sympathetic uh, you know the sympathetic uh, uh, pre uh, synaptic and uh, you know and uh, and, and actually post synaptic neurons yeah so basically um, as they leave yeah as they they, they, they basically leave uh, they leave the track they leave the track and uh, you know and basically um, synapse with the uh, Something like that, yeah. So they uh, assuming. So just to draw a little, uh, just to draw a few uh, for, for, for purposes of illustration, um, we are going to uh, to see that um, the, the sympathetic, the sympathetic, uh, the sympathetic system really plays um, a, a very big role as far as management of uh, you know of uh, high tension. Now, yeah. So from the from the from the from the basal motor center, we have we have uh, you know uh, neurons that basically um, that basically go to the you know to the baroreceptors. Yeah, they go to the baroreceptors of the you know of you know the baroreceptors. You know where the baroreceptors are located. Yeah, so they basically go to the baroreceptors. Then we have those that the postsynaptic that basically go to the heart, yeah, uh, to the heart and um, um, basically um, to the to the spine, yes, some, somewhere here, somewhere here, yeah, somewhere there. Then uh, we have those that go to the veins, yeah, that go, those that go to the veins, yeah. So this part is basically representing the veins, yeah. And then we have those that, that basically go to the arterioles, yeah? So we have this part, yeah, going to the arterioles, yeah? We have that part going to the arterioles. And then we also have one that basically goes to the, to the nephron, yeah? To the nephron, assuming, uh, assuming we have a nephron here. We have a nephron here. Assuming you have one nephron here, there are those that come to the to the um the juxta the juxta glomerular apparatus yeah of the of the nephron yeah the juxta glomerular apparatus of the nephron yeah so basically um a system a system like that yeah now to see how the different types of antihypertensives work. Uh, or bring about, uh, you know, a, a reduction in blood pressure, you should be very conversant with this uh, kind of, uh, of diagram, yeah? Again, to re repeat a little bit, we are saying that the sympathetic nervous system plays a crucial role as far as management of hypertension or as far as control of blood pressure is concerned, yeah? And where is that, where is that exactly is, uh, within the vessel uh, motor center within the medulla, um, 
the medulla oblonga yeah so it basically uh release and uh, and maybe the other thing that is very important to know is that um, norepinephrine yeah norepinephrine and neurotransmitter plays a very very big role it plays i want to repeat norepinephrine plays a very very big role as far as you know uh blood pressure is, is concerned because of course it is a neurotransmitter that is released uh you know uh, by the uh, sympathetic um nervous uh, system yeah now so having looked at this diagram having looked at this diagram we want we want to now uh you know describe the classes the mechanism of action and the classes of uh, you know of uh, of, of these uh, of these drugs remember again to recap we are look, we want to look at anti hypertensives yeah yeah so um anti hypertensives are basically divided into um, several classes yeah and the very first class we shall look at are what we refer to as the centrally acting anti hypertensives in other words uh, they are basically acting at this uh, at this point yeah are basically acting at that point. Number one, yeah. Number one are going to be the centrally acting, centrally acting antihypertensives. Yeah. In other words, they are they are, they are also referred to as the uh, centrally acting uh, sympatho uh, sympatholytics. Yeah. So what actually happens? What happens here? I'm going to to um. I'm going to I'm going to describe it a little bit more. Yeah. Remember here in this place there are neurons. Yeah. They are neurons. Yeah. Uh, again, I repeat in this place, they are neurons. Yeah. So if I can draw a neuron, if I can draw an example of a neuron here, if I can draw an example of a neuron here, um and so if this is our neuron. Yeah, it uh, basically has that part, yeah, which is the pre synaptic, yeah, and then the post part, and then the post synaptic neuron, yeah, post synaptic, um, the post synaptic neuron, yeah, this, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to expand uh, what actually happened, what, what the neurons that are. That are here and uh, expounded in this uh, um, diagram here. Now, remember these neurons basically have um, uh, the neurotransmitter in them is referred to as norepinephrine, as we said earlier. Yeah? So, norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter. So, when there is an action potential, when there is an action potential, now that stimulation, yeah? when there is an action potential, what actually happens is that. This uh, um, pre-synaptic uh, nerve ending basically releases it releases norepinephrine. Yeah, it releases this norepinephrine to basically come and uh, you know uh, that nore norepinephrine is released and it comes it comes to, to, to act in um, act on this uh, post-synaptic. You know, it is released to come and act on this post-synaptic. Uh, um, uh, neuron, neuron, yeah? But also remember, remember. I hope, I hope you in in your in your um, basic pharmacology, you you look at the distribution of uh, you know adrenergic receptors. Yeah. I hope in your basic pharmacology you look at the distribution of adrenergic receptors. Yeah. Remember, we have uh, we have uh, alpha and beta, and uh, alpha divided also into two alpha one and beta one. Uh, rather alpha one and uh, and alpha two and then the betas are also divided into beta one and beta two and they all have you know they all have their different locations i want you to to recap a little bit about what we learned yeah the distribution of the different adrenergic um, receptors in the body but uh one most important thing that i want to stress in this in this presentation is that <clears throat> at the end yeah, on the on the nerve endings, on the nerve endings, yeah, of these uh, these neurons, 
we usually have receptors of alpha one. Yeah, we have we said no, 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 not not alpha one, but we have receptors of alpha two. Yeah, so we have alpha two receptors on the nerve endings. Yeah, on the nerve endings, we usually have alpha two receptors. Yeah, so if I can demonstrate that, so we have alpha two. We have a receptor here for alpha alpha two. Yeah, we have a receptor here for alpha two. And you know, I hope you know this. Alpha two receptors are basically what? They are inhibitory. In other words, they call their inhibition, rather their stimulation is basically inhibitory. Yeah? When you stimulate them, they cause a negative feedback mechanism. When you stimulate alpha two, I want to repeat this because it is very important for you to know. When you stimulate alpha-2 receptors, they basically bring about a negative feedback mechanism. They cause, they, they, they inhibit release of something because, because that is a negative feedback, yeah? So stimulation of alpha-2 receptors causes inhibition or release. It causes inhibition of release of, of something, yeah, as we are going to see now. So, um, as uh, when when there is an action potential, as no epinephrine is released, yeah, as no epinephrine is released to the uh, postsynaptic, uh, you know, neuron, yeah, some of it, yeah, I repeat, as it is released to the uh, to the postsynaptic neuron, some of it naturally goes and you know and stimulates alpha two receptors. Some of it goes and stimulates the alpha-2 receptors. And remember what we say, that alpha-2 receptors are basically inhibitory. When we stimulate them, they cause a negative feedback mechanism. Yeah? So when they are stimulated, they basically cause you know, a negative feedback mechanism. In other words, they stop the release. They cause release of norepinephrine to stop. Again, I want to repeat at this point. Here, the new, we have neurons in this place, and it has been, uh, you know, um, expounded like that. Yeah. So we have the presynaptic, and then the postsynaptic. Yeah. So the presynaptic, yeah, they release norepinephrine. They release what? They release norepinephrine. Now. In a normal circumstance or in a normal situation, when there is an action potential, the norepinephrine will be released, yeah, to come and stimulate this post synaptic what? Nerve ending, yeah, to come and stimulate this post synaptic nerve ending. But it does not happen forever. It is not released forever. It is not released forever, I repeat. There is a mechanism that happens and so, and, and, and for that matter, uh, you know, release of norepinephrine stops. And what actually happens is that as some norepinephrine leaks out into this, uh, you know, this, uh, this space, yeah, to stimulate the postsynaptic membrane, some of it, some of it goes to stimulate the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor. And once it stimulates the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor, then it causes a negative feedback mechanism to bring about stopping of release of norepinephrine. Is that clear? All right, now, with that kind of information, with that kind of information, there are some drugs. There are some drugs that are given. There are some antihypertensive drugs that are given, and for them, their role is to cause stimulation, to stimulate the alpha-2 at this point. They are given to cause stimulation of alpha-2 at this point to stop release of norepinephrine. And remember, if, if, if norepinephrine is not released, then these effects will happen. Then we shall not have, uh, you know, we shall not, the heart rate will decrease, you know. If norepinephrine is not released, 
then we shall have, uh, you know, the baroreceptors will not fire. If norepinephrine is not released, then the, the venules or the, ven the veins will dilate, you know. If norepinephrine is not released, then the arterioles will also dilate. I hope you know the effect of the sympathetic nervous system on the cardiovascular system. Yeah. So again, if norepinephrine is again is if norepinephrine is not released, again you will have, uh, you know, the 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 ras, the ras, the renin aldosterone, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system will not be, you know, will not be uh, so much effective. Yeah. If norepinephrine. So so at this point here, we are saying that when we inhibit release of norepinephrine then we shall see the effects, we shall see the physiological effects, yeah? So I was saying that there are some drugs, yeah? There are some drugs that are given, and for them their role is to stimulate alpha-2 receptors. And once they stimulate alpha-2 receptors, then they inhibit release of norepinephrine. What are examples, what are some of the examples of these drugs that are centrally active, yeah? And one of the, one of the examples, one of the examples of these drugs are clonidine. Clonidine. So clonidine is a centrally acting sympatholytic drug. And basically, this is what it does. Yeah? It, when, it is, uh, when it is given, it stimulates, you know, it stimulates the alpha-2 receptors that are located on the, you know, on these uh, nerve endings, yeah, causing uh causing uh you know inhibition or causing uh inhibition of release of um norepinephrine yeah okay so basically that is what i wanted to demonstrate if i can wrap with this yeah so we are saying that examples of these centrally acting drugs uh one that does that an example is clonidine clonidine Clonidine, yeah. An example that basically does that kind of mechanism is uh, is uh, clonidine, yeah. So it basically stimulates the alpha two receptors at those uh, you know endings and uh, are bringing about uh, you know um, bringing about uh, uh, you know uh, a problem with with the lease, yeah. Of, um, okay. Now the other example, the other example that works slightly differently, yeah. The other example that works slightly differently is uh, methyl, alpha methyl dopa. Yeah, it is also a centrally acting. It is also a centrally acting, uh, you know, uh, sympatholytic, you know, drug. But it works in a slightly different way, as I'm going to as I'm going to illustrate to you, ladies and gentlemen. Now. For you to be able to understand how methyl, how alpha methyl dopa works, alpha methyl, yeah, the drug is called alpha methyl. Alpha methyl dopa, yeah, alpha methyl dopa. Now. For you to be able to understand how alpha methyl dopa works, yeah, for you to be able to understand how alpha methyl dopa works, I want to um, I want to, to basically illustrate something, yeah. I want to illustrate something for you to be able to, to understand how alpha methyl dopa um, works. So I'm going to illustrate it on this board. I'm going to illustrate it on this board, yeah? So normally, normally, um, just to, to do this a little bit, yeah? How does alpha methyl dopa work? So for you to be able to understand how alpha methyl dopa works, <clears throat> you need to know how uh, norepinephrine is synthesized for you to understand how alpha metal dopa works you need to know how 
um, you know, norepinephrine is synthesized in the, you know, in the central nervous system. And uh, just a little bit of, just a, a small illustration, assuming this is your nerve ending, assuming that is your nerve ending, yeah? So what actually happens, what actually happens is that, uh, you know, you have, um, within the nerve endings, they, uh, there is, they, they basically concentrate a substance called tyrosine. Tyrosine, yeah? They concentrate within the nerve endings, they concentrate um, a substance called tyrosine, yeah? Now, that tyrosine, that tyrosine is converted into a substance called DOPA. That tyrosine is converted into a substance called, called DOPA by, a, by an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase. By an enzyme called what? Tyrosine. By an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase, TH. Tyrosine hydroxylase, yeah? Now, this DOPA is further converted into a substance called dopamine. Are we together? This uh, DOPA is further converted into a substance called dopamine by, you know, by a certain enzyme, yeah? Now, once this dopamine has been, uh, once this dopamine has been uh, converted from DOPA, yeah? It now goes in, it is now pumped, yeah? It is now pumped into, you know, the different vesicles, yeah? It is now pumped into the different vesicles within the nerve ending, yeah? So it is pumped by what we call the monoamine, you know, monoamine uh, transport mechanism, yeah? Monoamine uptake. Uh, by what we call the monoamine uptake mechanism, yeah? So it is pumped into, it is pumped into the, you know, the different vesicles, yeah? Now, once it is within the, those different vesicles, once it is within those different vesicles, then it is further converted into norepinephrine, yeah? Which is stored again into those vesicles, yeah? So again, I repeat, uh, from tyrosine uh, to dopa, to dopamine, yeah? Then the dopamine is, is pumped into the vesicles uh, by the monoamine uptake mechanisms. And then uh, this dopamine is further converted into uh, norepinephrine, yeah? So I have dopamine here. So dopamine converted into nore. Yeah? So you have dopamine, dopamine converted into no epinephrine. So basically, when it is converted into no epinephrine, then the no epinephrine is ready to ready for in case of any uh, action potential to be released. Uh, you know, down here, yeah? It is ready to be released down here. Now, that is the natural, the golden load mechanism of how norepinephrine is, is uh, manufactured. Now, how does alpha-methyl dopa work in this particular context? Alpha-methyl Now, how does alpha methyl dopa work? When a patient is given uh, when a patient is given alpha methyl dopa, what actually happens is that it it again it passes through this system. Yeah, it passes through this system. So um, when a patient is given alpha methyl dopa, yeah, it it basically it basically starts acting at this point. Yeah, it. Uh, 
it, it confuses or it fools, it fools tyrosine, uh, rather it, 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 it fools, uh, it fools, it fools this enzyme as if, you know, it is the one that has manufactured it, yeah? It fools it. In other words, it is as if it is the one that has manufactured it. So, so this alpha methyl dopa basically comes in and starts at this point. When it comes in, it starts at this point, yeah? But remember, it is methylated. It is not just dopa, but it is alpha methylated which is different from this one, yeah? So we have an alpha methylated dopa. So we, when you have alpha methylated dopa here, when you have alpha methyl dopa here come in, yeah? So it becomes alpha methylated dopa. Now that, that alpha methylated dopa is still converted into alpha methylated dopamine. Is it clear? Is it clear? I'm saying that alpha methyl dopa, when it is given for it, it acts at this point. It starts acting at this point, but it goes through this, these stages. Yeah. So it is when it is given, it is basically, it is basically, it starts at this point, and then it is converted into alpha methylated dopamine. Yeah. So it is converted into alpha methylated dopamine. Yeah. When, once it is converted into alpha methylated dopamine, it is pumped into the vesicles. It is pumped into the vesicles, and then it is converted into alpha methylated norepinephrine. Again, I repeat. Once it is uh, once it is taken up here, it is converted into alpha methylated dopamine. And then it is again pumped into the vesicles through the monoamine uptake, uh, you know, mechanisms. And then it is converted into uh, alpha methylated dopamine. Yeah. And then uh, once it is converted into alpha methylated dopamine, it is pumped into the into the vesicles. And then and then again um, converted into alpha methylated nore epinephrine yeah so when it is converted into alpha methylated norepinephrine yeah um when there is an action potential when there is an action potential when there is an action potential and it is released yeah when uh, assuming we have another we have another another whatever down here So when it is released, when it is released, uh, that alpha methylated non-epinephrine is a very, very, I repeat, it is extremely, it is extremely important, you know, it is, it is like, uh, what, what do, it has a high affinity for, you know, for this uh, alpha, alpha two, yeah. It has a high affinity, yeah, for this iron. So once it is released, once the, it is released, it has a very high affinity for, for this alpha two. And it is a very potent, you know, very potent um, stimulator of alpha two, yeah? And as a result, if it stimulates the alpha two, then it will basically cause inhibition of release of uh, norepinephrine. And then, uh, and of course, if there is no release of norepinephrine, then the effects, yeah, then the effects of these uh, drugs, or rather the, the effects of, of the sympathetic system will not be seen, yeah? I hope you have now understood the mechanism of action of alpha methyl dopa, yeah? It is different from the mechanism of action of um, clonidine, yeah? It is different from the mechanism of action of Longitude. Yeah. All right. So uh, basically, um, basically that is that is what happens. Yeah. That is what happens uh, with this with the centrally acting. You know. That is what happens with the centrally acting uh, um, alpha. Uh, that is what happens with the centrally acting 
uh, alpha, you know, uh, sympatho sympathetic uh, drugs. Yeah. So they basically uh, they, they cause the stimulation of uh, of, of alpha two. Yeah, alpha two receptors, which are inhibitory in, uh, in nature. Yeah. So basically, that is what happens at molecular level. Yeah, at molecular level, that is what happens. But but physiologically, if there is no release of norepinephrine, we have said this earlier, if there is no release of norepinephrine, then that basically means that there will not be, uh, the, the, then the, the, heart, the, the heart rate will not increase. Yeah. Again, the effect of the sympathetic, I hope you know the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. If there is no uh, release of norepinephrine, then you will not have uh, the heart rate increase. You will not have the baroreceptors, you know, stim uh, be stimulated. You will not have the veins, yeah, constrict. In other words, they, they will dilate, yeah. Uh, then you will not have the arterioles constrict, yeah, they will dilate, yeah. And as a result, then they, it, it will help to, you know, put the blood, the blood pressure down. Remember, we said blood pressure is uh, as a result of uh, cardiac output and so forth. So that is, uh, that is, um, that is, those are what we refer to as the centrally acting, um, the centrally acting, uh, um, um, the centrally acting um, drug, yeah, antihypertensive drug. Clonidine, methanedopa, yeah. But we also have other examples, yeah, we also have other examples, yeah. And, uh, the other examples are we have uh, we have guanabens, guanafacin, yeah. We have guanabens and guanafacin, yeah. Guanabens, guanabens, guanabens and guana, guanafacin. Yeah, we have guanabens and guanafacin. These are also examples of um, of uh, of uh, centrally acting, uh, you know, centrally acting, uh, um, uh, centrally acting uh, sympatho, uh, sympatho, this is uh, sympatho, this is yes. And uh, and guanabens and and guanafacin also have uh, are also related, uh, kind of like uh, with clonidine. Uh, I'm also related uh, with, uh, with uh, Okay. So um, the other thing that I want to ask you talk about uh, are some of the clinical correlates of uh, of these uh, centrally acting uh, centrally acting uh, drugs. Yeah. The what you refer to as the clinical clinical correlates. Yeah. The clinical correlates of these uh, the clinical correlates of these uh, centrally acting. Uh, Anti uh, anti hypertensives. Yeah. Now, um, first of all, first of all, you should know, you should know that these drugs are not uh, are not considered, uh, you know, first line. Yeah. They are not considered the first line uh, drugs. Yeah. They are not considered the first line drugs to be given as far as uh, you know as far as the uh, management of hypertension is concerned. No, they are not. We have other, other drugs, yeah? Because of, uh, because of some of their side effects, yeah? One of them is uh, they lead to salt and water retention, yeah? Uh, they lead to salt and water retention, and uh, basically that is why they are combined with, uh, you know, with uh, diuretics. Now, how do they basically lead to salt and water retention? Uh, just to... To, to, to explain a little bit more. Remember, uh, once there is no release of norepinephrine, that basically means uh, the arterioles will dilate. Is that okay? The arterioles and the venules will dilate, yeah? Now, uh, where does water and sodium retention happen? Yeah, it basically happens in the kidneys, yeah? So when you have uh, the, the, the blood vessels dilate, when you have the blood vessels dilate, then that will give 
it basically gives ample maybe let me first ask this question if you have a, a blood vessel constricted and the blood vessel dilates in which in which of those two blood vessels does the no, if it is a pipe if, let me just uh, ask this question if you have a big pipe you have, if you have a big pipe and then you also have a small pipe yeah in which of these that does water move faster of course it moves faster in this yeah water moves faster in the small pipe compared to the big pipe so the same the same sense is basically used yeah the same explanation is used as to when uh, when we talk about that when we say that these uh, these things lead to sodium and water retention what actually happens is that when the blood vessels are dilated then the movement of uh, of of the filtrate or the, the movement of that uh, the, the the movement of the blood that if uh, if you remember very well the the, the physiology or the, the fun how the kidneys function is that as as blood moves yeah there is reabsorption yeah as it moves along the you know along the tubules then there is reabsorption yeah now if blood moves slowly yeah in the dilated uh, dilated blood vessels yeah so there will be too much reabsorption of water and and sodium compared to when blood is moving fast yeah compared to when blood is moving fast i hope you understand that yeah so these uh, centrally acting drugs basically bring about um retain they, they bring about uh, sodium and water retention yeah excessive sodium and water retention that is why by the way this is very important and we shall talk about it later uh antihypertensives usually are used in combination yeah they are used in combination sometimes they don't use one yeah but they combine them yeah so that is why um uh, these centrally acting drugs are, are used in, in combination with the with you know with di diuretics yeah and however they are not the first line they are not the first line drugs that are given in the management of hypertension all right the other thing is that um, um since they are centrally acting they basically produce uh, sedation yeah sedation and dizziness yeah since they are centrally acting they interfere with the structures of the brain and uh, usually they they produce uh, sedation and uh, sedation dizziness and vertigo yeah sedation dizziness and vertigo then uh, they also interfere with uh, you know with secretions yeah secretions in the mouth secretions in the nose secretions in the eyes yeah and therefore a patient on such basically has is dry in those areas dry eyes dry nose dry mouth what we refer to as zero yeah what we refer to as zero um xerostomia yeah xerostomia dry mouth yeah so they basically bring about um uh, dryness of the mouth of the of the nose and of the eyes yeah and um, it is also very important to know that uh, these drugs are never stopped as you are going to see for most of the antihypertensive drugs apart from a few but you never stop these drugs abruptly and of course uh, what is uh, what is the, the reason behind what is the reason behind here is that um, um, most antihypertensive drugs are never stopped abruptly because uh, uh, just take an example of, uh, of maybe a blood vessel, a blood vessel, and that blood vessel has uh, has uh, you know receptors, yeah. Um, it has receptors. Now, so if you continue, if you continually inhibit, yeah, give inhibitors, yeah, or or inhibitors of uh, of these receptors, what actually happens? They, they, there is too much sensitization, or there is upward regulation. Yeah, they express a lot of 
they express a lot of receptors yeah they express a lot of receptors if you you, you have given these uh, these inhibitors for a long time yeah on the on the on the structural surfaces the different uh, the different uh, structures the heart the arterioles and whatever they they basically express you know a lot of uh, a lot of receptors yeah because of the too much inhibition yeah what we refer to as uh, regular upward regulation yeah so once you stop once you stop the the inhibitor abruptly yeah then these receptors will react excessively they react excessively and they are, and therefore bring about disastrous effects yeah because there are too many yeah there are too many on the surface there are too many start being expressed on the surfaces of these yeah remember these are proteins yeah? these receptors are proteins yeah so once you continue inhibition too many are expressed on the surfaces of these uh, structures and once you once you stop abruptly once you abruptly stop yeah then you will have uh, disastrous effects so for that matter centrally acting uh, you know centrally acting uh, sympatholytics and not stop abruptly. They are not stopped abruptly. All right. And then uh, the other clinical correlate is that um, uh, methyl dopa is basically should be given with caution. One of them is that uh, it, it basically uh, can lead to you know hepatitis. Yeah. It can lead to hepatitis hepatitis and so what actually happens is that uh, <clears throat> once a patient is initiated on this they do regular check for what yes liver enzymes yeah they do regular check for liver enzymes to see whether you know whether the 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 the, the, the drug has not brought about any issues all right so that is it about um um that is it about uh, sympatho, you know, sympatholytic, uh, centrally acting sympatholytic, uh, you know, drugs. And uh, these are examples, I, I repeat, are clonidine, alpha methyl dopa, guanabens, and uh, guanafacin. Yeah. Basically, that is it about um, these drugs. Yeah. So, um, briefly, briefly, um, let's talk about. Um, another category of drugs another category of drugs and these are so we talked about these drugs yeah the other category of drugs that are rarely used that you will not you will not you rarely find in uh, in textbooks are uh, ganglion they are referred to as uh, ganglion blocker drugs yeah so basically they are rarely used and they are not of so much uh, pharmacological importance but uh, since we are doing, uh, actually they are no longer used, not that, not even rarely, but they are no longer used. And so we are not going to concentrate or uh, put a lot of much emphasis on these, yeah? These are referred to as ganglion blocker drugs. So they act at this point. They block, you know, they block here, yeah? So they, 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 they make sure that uh, they block this, uh, you know, this this ganglia, yeah, they block that ganglia, and so um, cannot, and so um, you know, norepinephrine cannot proceed, yeah, norepinephrine cannot proceed, yeah. Those are referred to as ganglion blocker drugs, yeah. So at this point, this we started with one. These are uh, now ganglion blocker drugs. Now these are uh, these are basically no longer used because. Uh, not only do they block the sympathetic ganglia, yeah. Not only do they block the sympathetic ganglia, but they also block the parasympathetic. Yeah. Not only do they block the sympathetic, but they also block the parasympathetic. And therefore, if they do that, you can imagine what can actually happen. It basically causes, a, you know, a malfunction of the entire autonomic nervous system. Yeah, so they are no longer used. Yeah, they are no longer used. And uh, an example of this is uh, hexamethonium. Yeah, 
An example of this is what we refer to as hexa An example of those drugs is what we refer to as a hexa, hexa methonium. All right, so basically we have talked about one and then we have talked about two. And an example of two are ganglion blocker drugs, yeah? And uh, an example is hexa methonium. Of course, if it, is, if it blocks and then there, there will not be release of norepinephrine, uh, then you will see uh, the effect in these places. But of course we said it is no longer used because not only does it block the, you know, the sympathetic ganglia, but it also blocks the parasympathetic of bringing or causing or bringing about, uh, you know, a problem as far as uh, the, uh, the autonomic nervous system is concerned. So uh, basically those are the two uh, so far that we have looked at. And uh, in another video, where we, we are going to, to, to look at, uh, in another video, we are going to be looking at uh, other classes of, of uh, other classes of drugs as far as, uh, you know, antihypertensives are concerned. Please make sure that you watch this video to the end and make notes. Yeah. So basically, that marks the end of our, you know, that marks the end of this presentation. When we, when we, when we, when we meet again, we shall talk about, um, when we meet again, we shall talk about other classes of drugs. Thank you.